Hey, John here. Let's talk about and uh, get an overview of how this Risk Five uh, computer processor architecture works. All right. So for this, I'm going to use some notes I've been cobbling together on assembly language programming, in particular, the introduction right here has kind of a narrative of this, uh, the, the uh, guideline of the uh, topics I want to discuss right now, okay? So this thing starts by saying, you know, here's a digital computer, you know, it has, you know, analog, quantum, and digital, right? So we start out very general in here. Eh, computers have storage system. They have volatile, which is your, you know, RAM uh, memory and stuff. And it has non-volatile, like, you know, ROM cards or USB drives, disk drives, and so on. We all know that computers have a CPU. And we've been talking so far, uh, I've been posting some uh, uh, lectures on how the execution unit works and how we build them using gates and state machines and so on. We talked about the arithmetic logic unit. I'll put a link to the playlist that has all this stuff in it if you are diving in in the middle here and you want to know what's going on. We talked about how registers can be built using latches and things like that. Now, this part is where we get a little bit more specific about RISC-V in general. So let's look at uh, how RISC-V specifies how these registers are to be used. Now, remember that the, there's a demarcation point between organization and architecture. I like to think that the that, that line goes through the machine language, okay? So what we're really looking at here, when we talk about RISC-V and the RISC-V architecture specification is how the machine language works. We also can talk about assembly language. The two are very closely related. People don't usually write code in machine language. It's very tedious. You're writing all, typing in all those numbers, the binary numbers or hex numbers or however you're going to do it. It's much easier to use assembly language. And as we'll see when it comes to RISC-V, it's a huge amount easier to use assembly language because the way the assembly language instructions are converted into machine language are not as intuitive as you might be familiar if you grew up programming things like IBM mainframes or 68K CPUs, okay? Now, let's look and see what happens with the registers in a RISC-V machine. So RISC-V, in this particular discussion, we're going to talk about a 32-bit version. We'll talk a minute more about the versions in a minute. Um, and uh, the registers in there, the fact that it's a 32-bit CPU, is, is, suggests that all the registers will contain 32 bits, okay? The program counters 32 bits and addresses are 32 bits and so on. That is what we mean when we talk about the RISC-V 32 kind of CPU. They have a RISC-V 64 and a RISC-V 128 as well. Uh, let's keep it simple and use the smaller one, the 32-bit, Okay. Now, each register inside of a RISC-V CPU, the total registers, I guess I should say, there's 32 uh, general-ish uh, purpose registers. Notice that this list starts at 1 through 31 here, okay? So there we say there are 31 general-purpose registers, okay? And by that, we say the CPU itself does not prescribe any particular function whatsoever to how you use these registers that it calls X1 through X31, okay? Now, there are two special purpose registers, X0, one of the 32 total registers, X0 has a special purpose. And the program counter, as we already should be familiar with, is also a special purpose register. It keeps track of the uh, instruction that's going to be executed, okay? Now, what's special about register X0? In this particular machine, X0 will always represent the value 0, no matter what. No matter when, no matter how, no matter what. So if any instruction ever tries to store any value other, at all into X0, it will fail. It simply will discard that value, okay? Now, the reason they do this is because the need to have a zero is extremely common, all right? Uh, as we'll see, this instruction set will take heavy advantage of this fact. By having a register that's always known to be zero, there are a number of things that can be generalized, like when you want to uh, perform an addition or something like that. 
you can always count on having a zero around so that you could, for example, add zero to something. And believe me, that will come in handy as we'll see as we move on, okay? Anyway, uh, by putting this value zero into what would otherwise be one of these general purpose registers, it simplifies the instruction set because if you ever need a zero value, a constant zero, you have one and it's known to be in one of the registers. Program counter, I think we're already familiar with. It keeps track of where you're going to execute the next instruction. The bits in the register I point out down here is specified by the instruction set architecture, okay? Uh, again, we'll see more about the, the sizes in a minute. Now, risk 5 part of the reason we're going through this introduction is to get some terminology down. They, they decided to refer to each one of the CPU cores. Well, you know, a lot of people are calling cores these days is a heart stands for hardware thread. Okay. Risk five CPUs have one or more hearts. You have a multi, you know, core CPU like a Pentium. Well, oh, I've got eight cores. Well, in a Risk Five system, you'd have eight eight hearts. Okay, each heart then has its own uh, set of registers and an ALU and a program counter. We then go on to mention that, which is obvious, <laughs> that if there's more than one heart in the CPU, it can do more than one thing at a time. I go on to discuss a uh, definition of peripherals here. It's a device that is not the CPU or the main memory, right? That's your hard drives, your your USB port, maybe a UART, a serial port, a, you know, a PCI card, you know, video card, things like that. Those are your peripheral devices. Now we get a little bit more formally talking about the instruction set architecture, okay? So this is the catalog of rules. It defines the instructions and the features the CPU provides. It doesn't say how the CPU provides them. That's up to the person that decides, oh, which gates, which muxes, how do I want to make the ALU? Do I want a barrel shifter? Do I want to, you know, how do I want to build the machine? That building side of it is the organization, okay? Right now we're talking uh, focused on the architecture, the instruction set itself, okay? As we will see, the instruction set uh, architecture, it is expressed in terms of the specific handling of every single bit in each one of the instructions that the CPU is capable of recognizing, all right? It says how it's going to e execute each one of those instructions. Now, a little bit more terminology. Now, the RISC-V in general has these modules, right? It has these base modules, and then it has these uh, uh, extension modules, Let's get some of the terminology down here. So RV stands for risk five. When you see RV32, as I pointed out before, that means that that heart, right, that that risk five CPU has 32-bit registers and 32-bit program counter in there. The I stands for integer. This is the base module. That means that RV, the I over here represents the minimum functionality necessary to comply with this specification. So if I have an RV32I processor, that means I got a RISC V processor with 32 bit regs and it is only equipped to handle the minimum in, uh, uh, integer instructions only. I can alternatively have, for money-saving purposes, an RV32E. The difference between the E and the I is the E simply has less registers in it. It only has 16 regs instead of 32. It's the only formal difference. You can go ahead and check the spec and verify that if you want. There is, as I suggested earlier, an RV64. And there's an RV64I. There will be then an RV128I. Again, all the I's and this one E possibility over here represent the absolute minimum functional set of operations that you need to, to do something useful, okay? The only real difference between these is the 32, 64, 128, all right? The uh, narrative in this in this set of notes is focuses on RV32i. If you want to extend that to the 64i or the 128i, that's actually not a huge quantum leap. You can go ahead and look at the specification and say, here's the differences, and here's how you think of these larger uh, machines, the bigger registers and so on.
Now, beyond that, they have these extension modules, okay? What does it mean? Well, let's say I want to be able to multiply and divide, even if it's an integer instruction. Those instructions are not mandated to be part of these minimum uh, complement down here in the base module. Why? Because you can always multiply by successively adding if you want, right? It's not necessary. And the reason they make these things add-ons is so that you can build a CPU without having an enormous number of gates. There are a huge number of applications, like microwaves, coffee pots, railroad crossing, gate controls, you know, uh, water plant, motor controllers, quadcopters. There's a lot of things that don't require even uh, simple multiplication. And there's more CPUs manufactured every day and put in products like that than any other products anywhere. I mean, hands down, by far, massive numbers of them. Why force a CPU to have instructions in it that never get executed? It consumes uh, silicon, wastes power, increases the costs, and everything else. So the point is, they allow the manufacturer of these chips, the consumer, you and me, to buy as minimum uh, amount of things as we need. It also formalizes what it means to add new instructions to this architecture. Okay, That has not been the case with a lot of very popular CPUs over the years. And as they grow and expand and get new functionality, the instruction set becomes a disastrous mess. The encoding of it, I should say, becomes a disastrous mess for uh, uh, the uh, hardware designers to deal with. And uh, the costs go way up, as noted if you've ever bought a reasonably fast CPU for your desktop PC. So the Risk v provides um, a vision into the future and a roadmap that says if you need to add more things, here's how we're going to do it. And the uh, committee, the consortium that, that designs this architecture has provided a, a formal spec for how integer math should be done and encoded, how atomic instructions work. Uh, that's a subject of a different uh, lecture. Uh, floating point numbers that are 32 bits long, 64-bit floating point numbers, 128-bit floating point numbers, compressed instructions, and all kinds of other things that come along in the natural evolution of these uh, of these systems. It's so common to need math and atomic and floating point and so on, that they decided that if you're going to end up with all of these extensions, rather than calling your processor a RV, you know, 32, I'm a FUD, you can just say G. And what you're saying is I've created a general purpose CPU that has the typical modern uh, complement of support. So I hope by now we all know how an, a CPU actually executes a program. What does it do? It executes one instruction at a time. It, it executes what we call the instruction cycle. And in each instruction cycle, we fetch an instruction, we decode it, and then we execute it. Now, I've already talked a little bit about how this might work in a very general uh, uh, drawing, a block diagram of a CPU that we might design that is somewhat compatible with how RISC-V would work, right? We looked at how the program counter is sent out to the memory. The memory then returns a word from that address. That's a fetch. We're fetching an instruction. We decoded uh, RISC-V is designed specifically to minimize the cost of silicon. It's decoded so very simply. We simply take the word that has been fetched and immediately extract, and as I showed in the previous discussion on how a basic CPU might be designed, we can decode a RISC-V instruction by directly extracting groups of bits in various fields inside of the instruction and just hard connecting them over to things like the ALU and the uh, multiplexers and demultiplexers that are operating the register file. Okay, The execution phase has to do with generating those clock signals that store the results that are coming out of the ALU to where they're going to go or, you know, advancing the program counter to the next instruction. Or if you have a branch instruction, you might be calculating an address and then storing that calculated address into, this, uh, into the program counter instead of simply adding it, uh, adding four in this case to point to the next word in memory to execute the next instruction. Now I proceed to state that, which should be obvious, the, the entire status of each one of these CPU hearts 
is stored in the uh, data values that are in the registers of the CPU. Specifically, it would be the 32x registers, gluting x0, right? And the program counter. And of course, for that to work, you have to store the instructions such that they're all lined up one after another, adjacent to each other in the main memory, and that you have some way to poke the, uh, the value of the program counter such that it is set to the address of the first instruction in order for the CPU to start running them. And then we go on to kind of throw a paragraph on each one of these things. The fetch goes out and, you know, fetches an instruction. The decode for us will essentially be getting the fetched instruction into that instruction register so we can extract those fields out of it and control the machine. The execution, I just discussed a few scenarios on what each instruction might do. The other thing that I uh, haven't uh, really uh, focused on yet is a suggestion of what you should do next. By default, uh, most instructions simply let the program counter fall in down along in the memory to execute the next one at the next higher address. You know, you're adding four to the program counter in this particular case on an RV32i. That would be where the next instruction will be, as we'll soon see. There are other kinds of instructions like branch instructions or jump instructions that cause the program counter not to go to the next instruction, but to be able to be pointed somewhere else entirely. Now, a little more terminology here, okay? Risk v uses the word jump or a jump instruction to, rep to refer to an unconditional branch, all right? An unconditional change of, uh, of address in the program counter. You're no longer sequentially processing. You're going to just jump somewhere else. It uses the word branch to refer to a conditional change in processing, okay? So you'll see there's a jump instruction and there's a branch instruction. And the jumps are unconditional. The branches are conditional. Now, the RISC-V has some interesting ways of branching. It, it kind of combines a compare instruction and a branch together in one single instruction. And if you go read the details in the specification that discusses why they've done this, it turns out you can build a machine at a lower cost if you have an instruction like this. They've evaluated a lot of different options and different architectures, and they've found that you can save money by eliminating, in particular, the flags in a CPU. Most CPUs I've ever come in contact with have, you know, condition codes and flags like the carry bit and the zero bit and the negative bit and so on. By throwing all that away, you have less things to remember in the CPU. Is the short of it? I'm oversimplifying, but by throwing away those flags, you're getting rid of some registers and all the circuitry to control them. It turns out that that alone can save you some money and potentially some time when building uh, what are called pipelined processors, okay? That's a subject of another lecture as well. Now, what do these instructions look like? They might do something like if the value in, you know, register X8 is currently less than that of the in uh, register X24, then feel free to, you know, proceed to the next instruction and, in, you know, at, 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 at the... Uh, current program counter plus four, fall through. Otherwise, branch to some instruction at a different address, okay? All in one instruction, where other CPUs might say compare X8 and X24, and then the very next instruction you might say branch if, you know, whatever, greater than or equal to, uh, to some other address. So they take two instructions and make it into one, which you obviously would have to do if you have no flags, because the only way you can do this with a compare instruction followed by a branch is to have this result somehow of the compare uh, stored somewhere so that the branch can then use that information to make a choice. And then to proceed to point out the obvious right here, that is that therefore a branch instruction can result in one of two different actions depending on the result of a comparison operation. All the other instructions that you have in this machine will always do the same thing. There is no concept of conditionality anywhere else in the instruction set other than these branch instructions, okay? And of course, once each uh, uh, once an instruction execution is completed, we then proceed to execute the next one by 
starting the new instruction fetch using the current uh, new value in the program counter. All right, now that we got a little bit of terminology down, you can go to the second to last page in this file where there's a thing called a re uh, R RV32i reference card, okay? Now, this is, let me zoom out so we can get a bird's eye view here. This is the entire set of all the instructions that are part of the RV32i specification. That's everything. It's about 40 of them in here. And of these 40, a lot of them really work the same way. So there's only like five or six general groups of instructions, all right? So let's zoom in a little bit and see what's going on here. What do we got here? Now, these are alphabetical. You can add, you can add immediate, you can and, you can and immediate, and so on. What What's, what's that all about? Well, we might be familiar with add. We already talked about that when we we're talking about how you might build a CPU that's capable of doing an add operation. You have a destination register and you have these two source registers, okay? So this is your three address machine in action here. This means, and you can see that over here. What is it? What is this thing? Uh, how, how do you how do you parse this over here? This is a detailed description of what the add instruction does. It says the destination register is given the result of this operation right here. And at the same time, the program counter is set to the value that's given by program counter plus four. Okay? That's what the add instruction does. There are no flags. There are no you know exceptions or anything else that can happen in here. That's the only thing that's going to happen right there. Okay? So that's how you read these columns in this thing. What is add immediate? Well, add I, you get a destination register, you got an RS1, and you have an immediate value. And what's that all about? Well, it turns out immediate means that there's a value that's stored in the instruction itself. In another uh, lecture, I will talk about instruction formats in general and the kind of things that you might run into in some CPUs. A lot of CPUs have this notion of an immediate value. And the way it works, let's zoom in on the details over here. You'll see it looks a lot like the add above it up here. But instead of adding RS1 plus RS2, we're going to add RS1 plus some immediate value. And you can see that's a link. So if you open up this thing yourself, I formally define what this immediate value is on apparently page 48. We'll get there soon enough. So what really happens here? I'm going to say add to RS1 this IMM value, these little subscript I and the subscript U and the subscript B and the J and so on. These are different kind of immediate values, but that's really the same thing in a general sense. It says RD equals RS1 plus this immediate over here, okay? This has to do with how we encode them, and we'll get there soon enough. While that's going on, I add 4 to the program counter. Okay, so that's how you read this notation, and almost every CPU has a document somewhere, somehow, that tells you here's what the uh, a template usage of the instruction is with some abstract names for the operands, followed by a description in this very similar to this notation that says here's what the thing is supposed to accomplish. So you might uh, yeah, run into and 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 immediate, and you'll see that like add and there'll be a or and x or like here's the x or and the x or immediate. Like I said, a lot of these are very much the same. Here's the subtract. Okay, you'll notice there's not a subtract immediate because. Adding and subtracting are the same thing uh, because the immediate value can be set to a negative. So they threw away that other instruction. There's no need to waste time with it, right? Uh, and I'm suggesting that your immediate values are assigned, obviously, by suggesting that, okay? So anyway, what's the point of that little digression is don't get overwhelmed by the fact that there's 40 things in here. There's really only like a dozen that uh, have different, uh, once you once you uh, figure out how the add works and the add immediate, you then automatically know how the and and the and immediate, the or, the or immediate, and so on. All of these other ones work. Now, we're going to see it has some pretty strange instructions in here, and we will learn why as we move forward. It has to do, again, with optimization. Whenever something really weird is going on, what you should un uh, immediately leap to in your head is this was obviously has to have been done for a reason, 
And the reason is to improve performance or save money. So let's look and see what this instruction does. Add upper immediate to program counter. We say AUIPC, and a lot of people call that AUIPC. This destination register and this immediate value. So what really happens here? Okay, here's our AUIPC. Destination register is given the result of the program counter plus IMMU. And then you advance the program counter to the next value. So this is a way of copying the contents of the program counter into some register. And while you're doing it, I can add, we will see assigned value to the value of the program counter when we're doing that. Okay. Now this upper jazz, we'll see what that's all about when we look and see what this thing is and how it works and where it is and stuff like that. What it's really doing is it's adding an immediate value to the left half of the program counter. It's a little, little non-intuitive, okay? But it goes along, it gets paired off with some other instructions. And in a group, they make sense. On their own, it's awkward, okay? I, I'll, 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 I'll agree with you on that. Okay, so here's now our branch instructions. What do these things do? Branch equal, branch, you know, greater than or equal to, and so on. You see this PC rel 13 and all this other jazz. What's that all about? Well, as I mentioned before, the branch has this built-in compare. Branch of not equal, branch of less than, you know, unsigned, less than, signed, you know, greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to unsigned. We all know about sign extension at this point. So we need to know whether we're making a comparison of two signed values or unsigned values in order to know what's going on. So let's look at the notation I use to represent this. This is branch if they're equal. So we say, look, program counter equals program counter plus this giant wad. So what's in this wad here, okay? If the RS1 is equal to RS2, these two operands in the instruction, the, the, these are like two registers, okay, in the register file, then what we do is we add this IMM value, this PC rel 13. I should make these notations consistent. That's your IMMB value over here you add that to the program counter. And as you'll see, that can be a signed integer. So you can program, uh, you could rather uh, uh, branch forward or backwards based on the value of this immediate operand, okay? If they're not the same, this is just the same as like in a C program, a ternary operator. If this condition is true, then the value of this expression as a whole is equal to the value of this IMMB operand in here. Otherwise, it's just simply four. So if the condition is false, we add four to the program counter and execute the next instruction. If the condition is true, we add some other value to the program counter and allow it to branch somewhere else. Okay, that's, every one of these is exactly the same. We just simply have a different condition. And whether we're dealing with signed or unsigned variables, we have to, we have to think about the comparison a little bit differently. Okay, what else do we got in here? We have jump and link. All the computers that are capable of executing subroutines have a, an instruction in there somewhere, somehow, that is a, some sort of a go somewhere and remember where I was kind of instruction, okay? We have a couple in here. We have jump and link and jump and link register, okay? So what does that mean? Jump and link says, right here, add, uh, what are we doing? We're going to store the address of the instruction to be executed next, if we didn't jump, into this destination register. Remember where I'm going to come back to. Okay, this says remember where I was. And then I can say the program counter equals what? Program counter plus this immediate value. Just like the branch instructions, we have this, this thing here. And again, I should improve my consistency in this document. Uh, this is an immediate value that is simply added to the program counter. That's how the branching uh, or the, the change of execution location is, is accomplished right there. Jump and link register is the exact same thing, except what we're doing now is rather than just adding some constant value, this immediate value to the program counter, I'm going to add that immediate value to a, a, uh, a general purpose register. Now, this cuteness over here on the right 
has to do with the fact that this is formally correct as per the specification. What this does is it makes sure that the least significant bit is always zero. You cannot jump to an odd address in this machine. There can never be an, an instruction at an odd address. If you ever try, it is a uh, it can be a form of an error. Okay. Uh, in the RV32i that we're focusing right now on, you will always only branch to an instruction that is a multiple of four. Okay, because the reason this thing says a multiple of two is because if you have compressed instructions that I mentioned earlier, what that really means is some of the instructions can be represented as 16-bit values, as a half word instead of a full word. Okay, so this actually gets involved with uh, uh, optional extensions. Okay, it could be a little bit misleading right now in this stage of the conversation, but suffice it to say that you cannot branch to an odd address or to an address that's not a multiple of the instruction size of the machine you're dealing with. In a RISC-V architecture, unless you have compressed instructions, all the instructions are going to be a 32-bit value, okay? Let me say that again. An RV32i machine, 100% of all instructions will always have four bytes in them and be 32 bits long. All addresses that are possible targets to branch to must be a multiple of four. Period. Okay. There are some options that allow otherwise, but for this uh, purpose, for our purposes, they're always going to be a multiple of four. You ever go to an address that's not a multiple of four, then you have an error condition on your hand. Okay. Fine. Here are some instructions that load bytes out of memory. How do you, you know, go get a byte from, you know, some place in, in memory and store the results into a register? Well, that's their load a byte load byte unsigned, and we'll look more, again, you know, the branching unsigned and signed, we'll look more at the formal details of this a little bit later. Suffice it to say, we have to concern ourselves with the differences between byte, uh, assigned and unsigned bytes, a half word and a, uh, um, a full word down here, okay? And what's this load upper immediate, right? Well, Louie over here is, a, uh, is an instruction where the uh, the immediate value here does not have enough bits in it to load the entire register. So as we'll see as we go on, this immediate value is loaded into the left half of the register, not the right half where you might think, right? If you say load register far with a three, you might think that, you know, in hacks, it would be set to 0000003. But in this machine, if you use this instruction here, it'll be loaded somewhere over on the left instead of on the right, okay? Again, this thing kind of goes along with some other instructions. Uh, like I said, if you think it's weird, then you're, you, you don't understand uh, the, bigger, the bigger picture of how this is used in, 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 uh, in concert with other things that they've made available to us, all right? Anyway, uh, the, the various loads, the byte, half word, and word uh, are there, so you can load, uh, you know, eight bit, sixteen bit, and thirty two value, uh, thirty two bit values. And the notation over here is explained earlier in this document. We talked about sign extending and zero extending values, right? So the way I uh, I just invented this notation here to make it fit on the page. If we're going to load a byte. And the byte is signed, so we type LB instead of LBU, all right? Load byte is sign extended after reading 8 bits from memory at this address right here. And that's how that works. Zero extended, an 8-bit value from memory here, okay? Sign extend a 16-bit value from memory at this address, Zero extend a uh, 16-bit from uh, value from memory at this address here, and so on. Here's a sign extended 32-bit value from memory at this address here as well. And I say sign extended even though, remember, we're focusing on RV32i, which means there's no extension that goes on here. But if you had an RV64i CPU, you would have to extend this 
value. So formally, this is correct, even though in our for our uh, for our purposes, the, we already have 32 bits and there's nothing to extend. All right. So uh, while this may look strange uh, in this particular context, it is formally correct. Okay. Um, there's your or and your or immediate. They work like the other ones. And the stores are the opposite of loads. Okay. And inside here, you can see that the, the M8 and the M16 is on the left of the arrow. All right. So what are we going to do at the address given by the contents of RS1 plus some immediate value store a value that comes from RS2 in this notation here says that the lo least significant eight bits are what gets stored in there. Down here, if I'm going to store, this is going to be store half word over here. You can see that, right? That says a 16-bit value will be stored in the memory at this address from RS2 in the least significant 15 bits. And again, all these ultimately will add four to the program counter when they're done. Unless, of course, they're uh, the, the jump up here that we saw earlier, right? Program counter equals whatever. Okay. Now we have our friend, the XLEN, coming in here. This is where XLEN comes from. The uh, shifting and so on. The, um, the length of distance to shift is obviously going to be dependent on the number of bits in the register. I talked about XLEN in a, our discussion on how the CPU uh, design works. The SHAMT over here is this it's an immediate operand, okay? So I'm going to say shift left logical with an immediate operand holding the size of the number of bits to shift, okay? Shift left logical where the length, the, the size, and the distance to shift is given in another register, okay? We have these interesting instructions over here. We have set less than, set less than immediate, and so on. What do these do? Well, they allow you to use the general purpose registers in lieu as if they are some sort of flags. Because remember, I said there are no flags in this machine. But let's say you wanted to have a, a flag, a Boolean value in a register that was true. If, say, RS1 is less than RS2, I can set a, a destination register to true, otherwise false. So you don't have to exactly branch around as much. Now, in some cases, branching can slow down. Your program, so this allows you to assess whether it would be faster to evaluate a conditional expression or you know evaluate an expression period using registers as flags or by just branching around conditionally a lot while uh, while reducing an expression to the result you're looking for. So we looked at shift left. There's some shift right instructions. We have the ability to subtract. And this store word, now again, these are in alphabetical order. So this goes along with the other store instructions up here. And we already talked about XR and XR immediate, and that is the entire instruction set. Okay, and the absolute details of how every instruction worked is in this right column. So what we're going to do is focus on how we would write programs and how the machine ex executes these instructions. All right, now we've done you an enormous favor. Every one of these instructions is encoded as a 32-bit full word. There are no variable length instructions in RV32i. Makes it real easy to fetch, real easy to decode these instructions. Even if you're building hardware and soldering together wires, this is a much easier thing to do than, say, the, uh, the uh, Intel processor or something like that, because the instructions are all variable length. They could be anywhere from one byte to, I don't remember, the longest one. It's like tens of bytes long, uh, as is uh, the case for many, many other CPUs. Now, uh, the next page in this document talk about the encoding of these instructions. Now, these are grouped by instruction type. And we didn't talk about this column over here, the R, I, and B, and so on. It's a little more obvious in this thing, I think. The, there's U-type instructions, J-type, I-type, B-type, and so on. What's with these types? It's like a bird's eye view of this thingy here. So it's the same exact instructions. However... They're grouped by how they're actually encoded. What are all the bits used for in these instructions? All right. So all the instructions like down here, look at all this whole chunk of instructions down here. These are the regular old uh, uh, register instructions down here. You add, subtract, and so on. All right. What do they got here? Well, this over here is the opcode in this column here. Here's where the 
five-bit value of the destination register number goes, right? We have 32 registers. Therefore, we need five bits to, to represent which register number we're dealing with. Now, when you look at this uh, chart over here, you see these big black slugs right here? There and there and there and there. Now, when I drew this thing up, I had a hard time visualizing in my head where these bits were if I had to express this thingy in hex. So these slugs show you every four bits. This is where the hex digits are going to, the demarcations of those things, right? So, for example, I know that if I'm uh, dealing with, let's say, an add instruction, these bits over here, which is a three, and one bit of the RD register would be in this hex digit right here. So this is either going to be a 3 or what, a B? If the register, if the RD register had a bit over here set to 1, what, do we, what would we know? That would be an odd-numbered register, right? If, it, if the register was even, there'd be a 0 here, and the value of this hex digit would be a 3. If the Reg uh, RD register was odd, an odd number, this would be 8 plus 2 is, uh, what, 8, 9, A, B, okay? So in my head, I find that easier to, to deal. Otherwise, you have to count out the fours and do all this together. Easier to make mistakes. This field over here is what is called the function, okay? So um, I don't believe I didn't, I, I should put headings in here to tell you what the heck these are called. I apologize. If you, it turns out, if you click on R type over here, there is a, um, a diagram that talks about each one of these fields in great detail, and that's called func3, and this is func7, and so on. That's, that's how that works, okay? So, sorry, but it's, it's in here, it's just not on this particular page. So anyway, this function here, look what's going on. Right, we kind of connecting a couple of things together here. When we talked about how the ALU works, somehow each one of the operations that it's capable of doing has to be enumerated in some way. If you look at this without knowing anything at all, and you say, hey, it's an add, a subtract, a shift left, logical, set less than, set less than, unsigned, XOR, shift right, shift, or, and, and so on. Look what's going on. The and has this three-bit value in this funk field. Connect this to the ALU, and you're done. Almost. What's this thingy over here all about? Well, some of these instructions, like add and subtract, have the exact same value in this func3. Remember when we talked about the difference between adding and subtracting in binary? And we observed that it's always just simply adding. In order to subtract, you need to flip the bits and add one of the uh, subtrahend, but when you're adding, you just simply, you know, add the two values. Well, look what's happening in this column over here. If you consider this bit here on its own, a fourth bit combined with these three function bits over here, in our design we discussed earlier, this bit here could be connected to that carry in and the complement B input on our ALU. So if this value is all three zeros, for example, the ALU would simply be adding. And if this bit over here is set, while it's adding, it will have complemented the subtrahend and set the carry in on the least significant bit of the adder. So adding and subtracting in this architecture are the same thing and they literally give you that extra bit right over here. So you don't have to spend all your time trying to figure it out by putting a combinational circuit together. You simply connect these three bits up to your ALU and this bit over here to the complement in and the, uh, or rather the carry in and the complement B. And these other function codes are the same way. Here's another two that, that have the same functions. Look at these instructions, shift right logical, shift right arithmetic. You connect this bit up to the shifting logic to let it know whether, when it's doing its shifting, whether it should replicate that sign bit or not. We talked about the difference between logical and arithmetic before. That's all this bit has to do. It's otherwise still just shifting right. Notice there's no shift left arithmetic in this machine. It's just simply shift left logical. All right. Now, what else do we got going on in here? So. 
as we saw, some of these instructions had immediate values. Some of them had this shift amount and so on. So this table shows you which bits are used for what. Okay, if you have an immediate value, you have to store it somewhere. Sometimes it's over here on the left. This one's nice and easy. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes five bits of the immediate value are over here, and another, uh, what is this going to then be? Another uh, four, f seven bits of it are over here. So sometimes you have to grab some of it from here, some of it from there. Here's one that has, again, a lot of bits, but they're all over on the left, same as down here. These are the I-type instructions. So now look at what's going on here. If it's an I-type instruction, all the fields are kind of in the same place. The shift instructions abuse this uh, value on the left. It's still considered an I-type instruction, but the shift amount, the immediate value representing the shift amount, doesn't have a lot of bits in it. So they're able to use some of the extra bits for other things, like in this case, the arithmetic versus logical again. And you'll notice that that bit that differentiates between the two here is in the same physical place as it was down here. All right, so you don't have to say, well, in this instruction, I look over in one place to find out whether it's logical versus arithmetic, and I look in a different place altogether in a different instruction, okay? So the immediate instructions and the regular old register instructions have the encoding in the same place, and this is thematic, and you're going to see it on steroids in a minute. Notice the function here. Whether I'm dealing with register operands, I got a 101 in this field for the shifting right. Look what's happening up here. If I go to shift right and I specify the shifting amount as part of the instruction instead of getting it out of the register like I do down here, we have the same function bits. So it turns out that you can connect, again, these bits directly to your ALU or your shifter or whatever other logic without having to complicate things by saying, well, which opcode do I have? <laughs> you know, is it an immediate instruction versus a register instruction? It doesn't matter. It's the exact same encoding of the bits that control your shifter and whether or not you're doing arithmetic versus logical. All right, so they've made it easier for you, but at the same time, it's kind of not obvious, especially if we get up here. Look at how this instruction up here is encoded. Or for crying out loud, this one over here. These bits are in crazy out-of-order structure, okay? They've done it to make it easier on the hardware, not easier on the programmer. Whenever the choice was made, should we make it easier for somebody to hand a code a binary number for this instruction, or should we make it easier for the hardware designer to save money and use less silicon and waste less power, they go with the latter choice, okay? So the heck with you as the programmer, kudos to the hardware. Makes all the machines cheaper, and in reality, nobody really hand encodes all these in binary. Anyway, they write it in assembly language and let the assembler reorder all these bits, okay? Because in the normal case, it doesn't matter that they're out of order. However, we care, because we're talking about architecture, which is these instructions over here, and we're talking about organization, which is how we're going to use these bits, all right? So this is my overview of RISC-V. These are the instructions. There are no more. This is everything. We can now proceed to discuss how the encodings work, how all these immediate values work, and I've got these diagrams. You want to look ahead, grab yourself a copy of this uh, uh, document from my GitHub page. I'll put a link to it below uh, in the comments below the video. And the uh, point is, if you go through each one of these instructions and all the different types, I've got some diagrams in here that show what happens. Here's this one that had them all in a weird order. Where do they go? How do you combine them? How, what happens with sign extension? Where are the sign bits, okay? So we'll talk about all this in another lecture. For now, this has been the introduction and a guidance on how to go if you want to work ahead on your own. Thanks for watching. See you next time.